So for some of it made clear, concise instructions, you know, change this number to this number, change this to this, made clear, concise instructions. Um, for one of them, though, specifically oh, number 13, I believe it was. Hello, Anakin. Um, Frank. I'm watching John struggle. Yeah, specifically number 13 on the test, Raph, he changed oh. uh, an he changed or to and. Yeah. Um, and I asked him about that. He's like, he he decided, I'm like, um, okay. So I made a decision. Um, but basically number 13 was, uh, if you spin a spinner once, what are the, pro what's he changed, uh, or to and what's probably like, probability of it landing on red and blue. And while if you're spinning it only once, um, how do you want us to do this? Do you want us to like probability of it landing on the line like, in between them or? Yeah, I don't know, man. It's whatever. We're in astronomy class now, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's what matters, I guess. See, I'm going to mute myself and just listen. <laughs> matters. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Uh, let's see. People can just join the meeting now. Let's roll the intro song just for old time's sake, and then uh, and then let's get to it. We got a big day today, so oh, share it. Share that screen. The intro song this is gonna be awesome. Here we go. Get ready. <laughs> Hello, space fans, and welcome to Professor Britton's Wacky Universe. Okay, friends, I have had way too much coffee this morning and I got 11 hours of sleep. So I'm feeling supercharged. You guys are gonna get my craziest me today. Oh, Marcus, I'm glad you're Hello. here. Can you hear me, Marcus? Yeah, I can hear you. How are you doing? Good, I hope you're doing better, buddy. Listen, you gotta change your format that you're sending me your files in. You're continuing to send me files in .heic and I am continuing to give you zeros. You can oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I know you didn't realize <laughs> that. That's why I'm here talking to you mano a mano here. So here's what I need you to do. Like that, On your fancy I'm iPhone, good. And I was like, I'm good. you go into your so settings. It's about... Oh, like hey, Amber, just mute yourself for a quick nine, second. All right, and then I'll, I don't uh, want them anymore. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, Marcus, um, yeah. you got to go into your camera settings. Uh, you go into your settings, then you go to camera, and then there's a, a tab called formats. You go to formats, and there are two options. One is highest definition, and the other is most compatible format. Why they have to word it like that, I have no idea. But you need to choose most compatible format, and that will make sure that your pictures are in a JPEG form. Then you can take a photo of your homework and send it to me. I can't give you points unless I can look at your work and I can't see your work if it's dot H E I C. So I need you to go and resubmit all your stuff. Okay. Okay, That's fine. Um, and, and I'm not just talking to Marcus here. I'm talking to all of you because a few other people have continued to, uh, to send me wacky formats. Here's the big takeaway. No zip files. If your files are too big to send, you're doing it wrong. You got to take a lower resolution picture or something and, and a, a good rule of thumb is in that little box, it should display your work and you should be able to see your work, okay? If you can't see it, then probably I can't see it. Some of you are like sending me stuff sideways. I actually thought about taking 10 minutes of our class today to just share my screen and walk through what it's like for me to grade your papers. So you can <laughs> the bullshit that I have to go through, okay? I'm guilty So professor, I am. <laughs> I'm definitely <laughs> wrong somewhere. No, uh, I think you're okay, Michael. I can't remember. Yeah. 
I, I think after Marcus, after the fourth time I saw HEIC, I was like, I'm going to talk. I'm calling Marcus out next time I see him. <laughs> but wow. most of what I'm afraid wow. of is, is I'm afraid you're not going to notice that I'm giving you zeros. I'm just giving you yeah. zeros to get your attention so that you will resubmit in a way that I can see it. Okay. Like I, I had no idea. Um, but my question is, so I just went in and I changed it from high efficiency, high efficiency to most compatible. Do I need to retake those pictures or are they already done? Um, I believe you do need to retake them because they're stored in your phone now as HEIC. So if you snap the new pictures, they will be at the lower resolution JPEG format. All right, I'll, I'll be doing that. All right, thank you, buddy. Hello, Hope. Hope. Ellis. Hi, friends, everyone who's just joined us. Nice to see all your faces. Nice to see your pooch, Jenny. I like dog crew. OK. <clears throat> um, all right, so why don't we get into it? I'm going to go over here to speaker, to locked speaker mode. And I'm going to lock it on me. Uh, we've been talking about stars. Oh, by the way, I figured out some new lighting techniques in my house. So I'm hoping that today's notes are going to be a lot nicer. Can you see how bright and shiny that board is? I'm hoping. Yeah. That, yeah. I'm hoping that this really makes our note taking better. I did some some lighting tricks here. They don't make me look good, but they make the board look good, which is what's important. Okay. Um. Uh. Sorry. I'm just adjusting the adjusting the little table here. Okay. So, uh, class. Uh, last time we were learning about the physics of stars, and pretty much we spent uh, getting to focus get into focus it's just the weird i don't know why it it always wants to focus up close when i'm far away and when i actually bring things up close there we go okay so um last time we worked on some aspects of stars mostly uh calculating their distances using the parallax technique very important to astronomers we also um learned a little bit about the magnitude system the magnitude system is kind of a a historical measured method of ranking the brightnesses of stars by your eyeball, which seems kind of weird, but it's a over buzz. pardon? I said the magnitude system is a buzzkill. <laughs> it kind of is a buzzkill. It, it, you, dude, you have not even begun to explore the hideousness of the magnitude system. If you think that's bad, just wait, wait until you see what starts to happen uh, this week and next week. But unfortunately, you need to learn this because since you're here to learn about astronomy, magnitudes are so baked in to the chocolate chip cookie dough that is astronomy that you can't, you can't really understand the lore or the way astronomers think unless you understand magnitudes. It's one of the things about astronomy that makes it different than a modern science like cognitive science is astronomy is thousands and thousands of years old. Astronomy is older than the concept of science itself, right? So in some ways that makes it kind of classical and kind of, uh, you know, classy, but in other ways you have to put up with some, some wacky quirks, which I'm okay with because I'm a wacky quirk kind of guy, you know? That's why we go together so well. Hmm. Um, so let's review magnitudes, or why don't you guys help me review magnitudes? I want to start off by saying, um, <clears throat> Last time, you only learned about one type of magnitude called apparent magnitude. And in apparent magnitude, we use a lowercase m to represent apparent magnitude. Um, what do you guys remember about this apparent magnitude? Um, it's the ranking of brightest of the brightness of stars. Yes. Was that Frank's voice I heard? Yeah, it was. Nice to hear from you, Frank. I'm just, I'm scrolling through my peoples here looking for you. Actually, hold on, guys. I want to hide the trolls. Let me hide the trolls so that I can find the faces better. Hide non-video participants. Okay. All right, cool. Now I can see your, your cool faces. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. So remember that when Hipparchos, the greatest of the ancient Greek astronomers, I think I've spelled his name right, Hipparchos, um, he ranked the stars so that the brightest star was supposed to be a first rank brightness star, a magnitude of one. Uh, the second most brightest stars were a magnitude of two. And they went all the way down, dot, 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 to the faintest star he could see was a, uh, a magnitude six. 
So the brightest stars were apparent magnitude of one. <clears throat> the, uh, the fainter stars were an apparent magnitude of six. Now my astronomy 1010 students who've had a lesson on the history of astronomy, they're going to remember that, uh, that, that the telescope was not used for astronomy until Galileo built the first one in the 1600s. And uh, once people started using telescopes for astronomical objects, they, Galileo being the first of them, they could now see stars to much fainter magnitudes than uh, the, the original ones that Hipparchos had looked at by eye. And over time, that caused astronomers to kind of decide that they were gonna kind of shape up and redefine the magnitude system so that it was on a firm mathematical footing. They pegged a change of six magnitudes to a flux ratio of 100. And what that means, if it sounds too techy for you, is it means that the ratio of two star brightnesses, star A to star B, is 100 to the power of the change in magnitudes divided by five. You guys will remember that we, we did uh, a couple of problems with this, and you guys seem to handle it just fine, okay? So that formula looks a little nutty, but it's not a big deal. They also made sure that they, they pegged all of the magnitudes to a single star, and that single star is the star Vega in the constellation Lyra. Vega is a spectral type A star. Today I'll be teaching you about spectral types. And uh, Vega is a star that is not a binary, nor it is a variable. It has a very steady light and a well-defined spectrum. And we've pegged the magnitude of Vega to be a zeroth magnitude star, and all stars are ranked by their brightnesses according to that one. You guys may remember that the brightest star in the sky is, as Raf mentioned, the sun, but do you remember what the second brightest star in the sky is? Um, it's, um... Polaris. No. No, it's the other one. Um, Let's start with a B. I forgot the name. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Sirius or something Sirius. like that? Tim's got it. It's Sirius. Oh, Sirius? Oh. Sirius if, you, or if you forget about the sun, Sirius is the brightest twinkling star in your sky, okay? Gotcha. And you guys can see Sirius just at the foot of Orion. It, it's, it's extremely bright. It kind of looks like a planet. Sirius has an apparent magnitude of minus one. The sun, of course, I mentioned this last time, you can actually measure the magnitude of the sun on our sky. It has an apparent magnitude. Minus 27. So that's, you know, I think the moon is maybe an apparent magnitude of 12 or so, the full moon. We can also go to many greater magnitudes. <clears throat> okay. Um, before I tell you about absolute magnitude, which is where I'm going to start today, I kind of want to go off roading with you guys and I want to tell you some real deal astronomy stuff. And this is because I know a couple of you may go on to study this. And I want you to hear the truth from me first. Astronomers, uh, when they take images of stars, they, they often use uh, CCD cameras. We've talked about this. And I thought maybe I could show you guys a CCD camera. Hold on a second here. Um, I grabbed a little to-go box from the observatory before I left because I thought it might be fun to do some show and tell with you guys. And... Um, <clears throat> We've got a number of different CCD cameras that we attach to our telescopes. Here's my ATIC camera, and I actually have not one of them, but two of them. The one that's been used a little bit more uh, and chewed on by mice, this is our monochromatic camera. It's a black and white camera. All right, so if I open it up, you can see the housing unit here. Hold on. That's the telescope, and I'll take off the cap, and can you guys see that, that chip that's in there? Maybe I can shine some, some light on it. That chip is the CCD camera. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Yeah, look in there. You can see that chip. There's your CCD. And that's a bunch of little tiny gridded pixels that collect photons and make a digital image. Ooh, cool. You're getting a little diffraction there. Um, in any case, astronomers never work with color cameras the way that a wedding photographer would. Because colored cameras are a hideous, hideous waste of photons. And in astronomy, where starlight is very weak and of low brightness, we are eager to gather every photon from space that we can. And I thought maybe we could take a moment here 
This is a little bit of an indulgence on my part, so please forgive me. Uh, but I wanted to tell you uh, really briefly about how color cameras work so that you can understand why astronomers prefer black and white cameras. So let me go to share screen for a moment. Uh, let's exit out of this video. And let's go over to Mr. Google here. And I want to type in the bear, the bear matrix. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the camera that is on your uh, cell phone, the color camera on your cell phone, um, has also a CCD in it, but the CCD is covered over by something called a bear matrix. It's this little grid of pixels where each single pixel on your camera is actually four micropixels. And the four micropixels are one red, one blue, and two green. Did I tell this to you guys before? Did we talk about this? Oh, okay. Now, the incoming light gets passed through these little pieces of glass, these filters, and only the red light gets captured by this pixel, the green light gets captured by those two pixels, and the blue light gets captured by this pixel, and then they mix them all together to make a single colored pixel. So every pixel on your camera has been filtered into its red, green, and blue components. And as you know, by mixing various quantities of red, green, and blue, you can pretty much make any color in the damned universe. Now, this is fine if you're a wedding photographer. First of all, qu thought question for the class. Why are they sampling green twice, but red and blue only once? Why do you think there's two green pixels, only one red pixel, and only one blue pixel? Why would they do that? Why wouldn't they have some pixels that have two blues? Why wouldn't some pixels have two reds? Wouldn't we want to sample the colors equally? Why sample more green than any other color? Is it because green is yellow and blue? Uh, nice try, but not quite. Aww. It's about the color sensitivity of the human eye. The function of a camera is to take a picture that looks like what your eye is used to seeing, right? Who cares if you get the proper amounts of green and blue and red? This is, this is the human sensitivity to light right here in this graph. You'll notice that the human eye is very sensitive to uh, yellows and green colors, but as you get towards the edge of the visible spectrum, your eyeball is able to detect and capture less red photons and less blue photons. Your eye has a natural green bias. Things tend to look greener than they are in reality because your eye is better at capturing green photons. It's a selection effect. So the reason why the bare matrix has two green pixels for every blue and red is they don't wanna show you the picture as the color truly is. They wanna show you the picture as what would it look like to your naked eye if you were looking at it with your naked eye. So it's a sampling issue. It's a signal processing issue. In any case, I'm trying to tell you that an astronomer would never use the bare matrix to take images of space because here you're wasting and throwing away one third of your photons. Every time you take a picture of the star Sirius, it's only going to gobble up some green photons here, some blue and some red. You don't want to filter out any photons. What's the astronomer's solution to this problem? Uh, well, I will show you if... I can remember to call up my slideshow here. The astronomer solution is basically to reproduce the bare matrix manually. They use a black and white CCD camera. And then you can see here in slide 38, they take the pictures of the stars three times using filters. And the classic filters are red, green, and blue. We take a picture of stars using a blue filter, we take a picture of stars using a green filter, and we take a picture of stars using red filter, and then we mix them all together to make a color image of the stars. Yes, it is a lot more work, but it means that we're capturing more light. Now at this point, you might rightly say to me, geez, Brendan, why am I getting a lesson on digital photography? This is not what I was expecting to hear today. Uh, okay, fair. But let me tell you that this trickles down into the magnitude system. So if you thought magnitudes were complicated before, get ready for this. In astronomy, we oftentimes take a picture of a star three times and we assign a magnitude 
in each color band. So there is a blue apparent magnitude. There is a green apparent magnitude, which for some reason, astronomers call V for visual band magnitude. Don't ask me why. And then the red band magnitude is thankfully called R. Yes. Now, I've got a question for you guys. Suppose I took a picture of a star three times with three different filters. And suppose I got a magnitude in the R band of positive one. Suppose I got a magnitude in the visual green band of zero. And suppose I got an apparent magnitude of minus one in the blue band. So you basically took three different pictures and they looked like this. What do we know about our star based on these three photographs and these three magnitudes? It's um going away. It's no, going this is this isn't the, this isn't a dop a nice try, but this is not a Doppler shift. By the way, blue uh, shift moving towards you, so yeah. yeah that's, that's, <laughs> No, no, this isn't a Doppler shift thing. Doppler shifts are where you measure absorption lines. Here we're just taking a picture of the star three times. Oh, thank you very much. The magnitude zero. You're welcome. No. Oh, it's yeah. really hot. Okay, it is. How did you know it was really hot? Because it's it's blue -er than the other colors and blue. Yeah. Is the that's the, wait, who's talking to me right now? Who's the Nathan. smarty out there? Nathan. Who's that? Nathan. Oh, you're, you're trolling me, Nathan. I see what's going on. Yes, Nathan, you may be in the shadows, but you are right on point, okay? Listen. Hell yeah. Nathan is telling us that this star pumps out more blue light than it does red light. And this is a very hot star, and this is a bluish star. If we went back to our share screen here, and I were to share my slideshow with you, remember that, um, uh, activate the slideshow. Where's the picture here? I wanna find for you guys. Ah, fudge. Okay. Uh, I should always just share my screen. Sharing the PowerPoint never works. Uh, somewhere here in this slideshow, I wanted to remind the class, here it is, that stars function essentially like black bodies, slide 62. And so there are very hot stars that pump out more blue light than red light. That star that we just sampled was probably something like this blue star near 20,000 Kelvin. It's pumping out a lot of blue light, medium amounts of green light, and less amounts of red light. Very good. So, in other words, I can measure the color of a star and thereby measure its temperature by coming up with a color index. People usually do blue minus green, and they define that as the color of a star. This is kind of a poor man's spectroscopy. And in astronomy, it's known as... Here's a fancy word, spectrophotometry. It's cheap spectroscopy. It's faster and it's easier than normal spectroscopy. Astronomers use this stuff all the time. Now, normally this would be a little bit over your pay grade. This would be at the 200 or 300 level astronomy class. But I happen to know that this stuff is going to come up in your labs, so I figure why not tell you about it now? And plus, that means I was there first, okay? All right, so now that you know apparent magnitudes, if I write little lowercase m, that just means bolometric. That means black and white or summed over all colors. This is apparent magnitude in general, but if I want to get into the weeds, I can actually measure apparent magnitudes in different color bands. And that means this can get confusing wicked effing fast, okay? So hang on to your hats. We'll be going for a ride. Have you guys got all those notes? Because I want to start giving you some new ones. Frank says yes. Ellis gave me a thumbs up. Tim I, took I took photos if anybody needs them. Okay, uh, you are the best, Riker. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I've got one more little thing to do on magnitudes, and then we'll have some fun historical lectures. So hang on. We've got a little more technical stuff to do here. Okay, at some point, people got a nutty idea about magnitudes that turned out to be kind of useful. Okay. 
in some ways, apparent magnitude is kind of like an indicator of brightness. But in the same way that the focus, focus, oh, this, oh, dude. this camera is driving me goddamn nuts. It's like there's no rhyme or reason to its autofocus whatsoever. Your, your hand looks really good when it's all the way zoomed in. I know. That means it's focusing like up here. All right. If yeah. I put some, uh, there's no logic to it. Okay. Um, the apparent magnitude is a logarithmic measure of brightness. Logarithmic means it's kind of compressed so that you're measuring brightnesses in terms of the power of 10 rather than as a brute number itself. Um, at some point, people invented a new concept called absolute magnitude. And the idea is that absolute magnitude uses a capital M, and absolute magnitude is supposed to be like a measure of the luminosity of a star. That's its total light output in all directions. And let me define for you what the absolute magnitude is. Absolute magnitude is the apparent magnitude a star would have if it were located at a distance of arbitrarily chosen 10 parsecs. So tr let me try to parse that one with you again. Absolute magnitude, which uses a capital M, is the apparent magnitude a star would have if by magic it were located at a fixed distance, at a fixed distance, of 10 parsecs. Take a moment to write that down, and then I want to show you a slide. Share screen. Oh, I didn't get that. Yeah. Oh, I was too fast for you? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Let's give it a moment. We'll chill. Really bad glare. Oh, we got glare. No, I got glare. Oh, let me. Remember, I'm, I'm taking. I'm taking pictures. I got a glare from my window in the back. Oh, I see. But that reminded me, I needed to twist my blinds as well. Okay, are we cool now? Yeah, I got it. All right. Yeah. Um, because that's kind of a whopper. I need to just kind of share my screen with you so that you guys can get a better sense of what I'm talking about. So let me go back to my slides on apparent magnitude. Apparent magnitude is just kind of how bright does my star look, right? But the idea is that the stars are located at a variety of different distances. And this creates a big confound in astronomy. When a star is bright, it could be bright for one of two reasons. It could be bright because it's fundamentally more luminous than its neighboring star, or it could be bright because it just happens to be way freaking closer. And this is what's called a, a confound in science. It's two comp competing variables that we're trying to untangle. Absolute magnitude imagines that we break the confound by just saying, what would happen, what would these stars be like if they were all at the same distance from Earth? And they probably just chose 10 parsecs because everybody loves the number 10. And it's just, a, it's kind of a nearby distance. Uh, there aren't too many stars that are, 10 parsecs is a reasonable distance for a star to be, but it's still on the closer side. Um, so let me just show you a cartoon that I think helped me a lot. And let's see if you guys can understand this. Let's imagine we compared two stars, the sun and Aldebaran. And I would like to do this on the board actually. So if we made a little chart, 
I think this would be good to have in your notes. And we compared the apparent and the absolute magnitude for the sun and the famous star in Taurus called Aldebaran. Is it Aran? Aldebaran. The sun has an apparent magnitude of minus 27, but it has an absolute magnitude of positive five. Aldebaran, I believe, has a magnitude of, an apparent magnitude of positive one. Let me just check. Oops, sorry. I don't want the chat. I want to share screen. Let me just check that one more time. Positive one and negative one. We'll say that, okay? So Aldebaran has an apparent magnitude of positive one, but an absolute magnitude of minus one. So I think it would be very helpful for you guys to just take a minute and try to wrap your brains around this. What is this column telling me about my two stars? Uh, the, the first column is that because the sun is closer, it appears brighter. Exactly. And how about the second column, Riker? Uh, the second column is on an actual scale of magnitude, the sun is actually a positive well, five. Don't say on an actual scale of magnitude because magnitudes could be apparent or absolute. Let's clean up our speech here. Um, well, I think what you meant to say is... In, if in actual brightness. Uh, brightness involves distance. You don't, you don't want the word brightness. On a scale of apparent magnitude. No. No. On the scale of... Uh, what quantity absolute. determines how much light a star puts out? Luminosity. Thank you. So rephrase your statement there. Aldebaran, uh, with the, using the absolute magnitude, Aldebaran has a higher luminosity than the sun. That's right. The sun might be brighter than Aldebaran, but if they were both moved to the same distance, we would realize that Aldebaran is brighter because it's more luminous, right? It pumps out more, the Aldebaran pumps out way more light than the sun. If the sun were like moved to 10 parsecs away, we would barely be able to see the sun with our naked eye. We'd have to go to a very dark sky, like one in, I don't know, the deserts of uh, Chile or something. Okay, so magnitudes are a little weird, but by the way, I don't know if you've ever heard in your math class, magnitude usually means I am a number and I have no units, right? Like when someone talks about a velocity like five meters per second, this part of a number in mathematics is called the magnitude and this is called the units. So magnitudes were intentionally designed to not have units because they're just kind of like a wacky number system. But the idea is that you can measure all kinds of properties of the star using magnitudes, even properties that are wildly different. Not only can you calculate the brightness in apparent magnitude, you can compute the luminosity in magnitudes as well. And if you thought that was freaking crazy, oh my goodness, get ready to just have your, your mind explode here. We can also measure distances in magnitudes. And once again, I'm going a little off-roading here, but this is the point. There is a quantity in, in astronomy known as the distance modulus. It is a subtraction of apparent minus absolute magnitude. And the idea is if you subtract the apparent magnitude, the brightness, from the absolute magnitude, the luminosity, the subtraction of those two is kind of an estimate of distance. Now, this formula probably will come up in one of our labs, but I would never test you on it. But I want to show it to you anyways. Why? I don't know, because it's kind of important in astronomy. So I'm just throwing this out there that not only can you measure brightnesses and luminosities and magnitudes, you can measure distances. Now, at first, it's not going to seem like we're using this much, but these concepts are going to start creeping into our discussions of stars. And at some point, they're going to become integral for us to understand how astronomers go out and collect data. And I like our lectures to be focused not just on the concepts and the theories, but how do the scientists gather this information. Okay, so you now learned more than you ever wanted to know about the magnitude system. That will come back to haunt you later, all right? It's time for us to, um, to get into the science of how we began to compare stars to one another. 
And uh, that's going to involve uh, a couple of different aspects uh, of our lecture. Here. First of all, I want to introduce a new formula to the class by taking two old formulas and smushing them together. So let's get ready for some new notes here. Introducing a concept. This concept is called the Stefan Boltzmann Law for Stars. It's going to involve us combining two of our older formulas together. Okay. Let's imagine we have a big old star, and this star has a radius r. And let's imagine that it's pumping out light in all directions. That is, this star has some luminosity. We can also talk about the brightness at the surface of a star. <clears throat> So here I'm going to draw a little window, maybe one square meter at the surface of a star. And I want to remind you that I can measure the brightness as some number of watts per square meter. When we did this for our own sun, we discovered that the sun is pumping out something like 65 million watts per square meter. So every square meter panel on the surface of the sun is 65 million watts of, uh, of brightness. Now, I know that the brightness is ultimately controlled by the surface temperature of the star. And that's the surface temperature that's at the photosphere. And the Stefan Boltzmann law tells me how a black body glows. It tells me that the brightness at the surface of my star is proportional to sigma t to the fourth, where sigma, of course, is the good old-fashioned Stefan Boltzmann constant. I could write that up here if you're really interested. 6 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth. There's another way I can calculate the brightness of my star. If I know the luminosity of my star, I could use the inverse square law. This time, I'm going to use the version that uses not the distance to the star, but uses the star's radius. Because I'm trying to find the brightness not on my sky, but I'm trying to find the brightness here at the surface. These two brightnesses are the same brightness, but they're seen from different perspectives. This one is the cause of the brightness, which is the temperature, but this one says the brightness will be the total luminosity divided by the surface area. If I plug these two formulas together, I can get a new formula that looks like this. The luminosity of my star is equal to 4 pi r squared times sigma t to the fourth. And this formula is known as the Stefan Boltzmann law for stars. In other words, we have discovered an important relationship about stars that the luminosity of a star is proportional to the square of its radius times the fourth power of its temperature. This is a key point in astronomy. Take a moment to write that down and then I will explain it. You guys got that? Send me some yeah. stuff or something. They should have more reactions than just this. Oh, that kind of thumb up. Or any kind of thumbs up. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we should try to make use of these thumbs up more often. Oh, Ivy's yours changed color. How did you do that? Um. I That's don't not remember. an option for me. I got yellow thumbs. Okay, I like it. Alice, you still writing? 
Okay. I like it. Hey, um, let me show you a slide here that explains all that jazz that I'm just talking about. Uh, whoops. We'll come back to that historical lecture in just a moment. Okay. Um, I felt like we should cover this before we did the fun stuff because this will be helpful. Oh, balls. Hold on. Cancel. Uh, F5. What? 56? Yes. Okay. All right, class. I want you to talk through this one with me, okay? I have two stars. The two stars are exactly the same size. One, like our sun, has a temperature of 6,000 Kelvin. The other has a temperature of 10,000 Kelvin. The star on the right is more luminous. Can you explain in touchy-feely terms why the star on the right is more luminous than the star on the left? Because it's hotter. That's right, Michael. And hotter objects pump out more light. Very simple. Nicely done. Okay. Now let's check the bottom guy. On the bottom, I have two stars that have exactly the same temperature. Same as the sun, 6,000 Kelvin. But one star is a giant star with a bigger radius. The one with a bigger radius is more luminous. Why? Because it's bigger. Or elaborate. Uh, it has more area for light to shoot off of. That's right. It has more square panels across its surface at the same temperature. And more square, square panels is like having more light bulbs. Very good. This is why red giant stars, despite being quite cool, oftentimes can be some of the brightest stars in your sky. <clears throat> Betelgeuse or Aldebaran are red giant stars or Antares that have just stupidly huge radii, and this makes them brighter. Someday our sun is going to turn into a red giant, and it will be more luminous as a red giant than it ever was as a so-called main sequence star. Okay, I figure even though the Stefan-Boltzmann law started off as a kind of techie exercise, this is some pretty good intuition for us to have about stars. I needed you to know that a star can pump out more light, one, because it's hotter, or two, because it's bigger. And that's kind of important. And it's now time for y'all to get a little history lesson on how stellar spectroscopy began and how we learned to classify the stars. Now, I'm going to give you a history lesson on the development of something called spectral types. And I probably won't take notes on this function F539. I'll probably just tell you a story, and I'll use my slideshow as we go. So I'd like to show you guys a picture here of a legendary astronomer that you may never have heard about known as Edward Pickering. Edward Pickering, shown here on the left, was once the director of the Harvard College Observatory eh, around the turn of the century, or the last turn of the century, late 1800s to 1900. And this guy has uh, some interesting historical claims to fame, but the one that we're interested in now is Edward Pickering was one of the early pioneers of using spectroscopy, the art of taking a prism and breaking starlight into its component spectrum. He was one of the first people to actually break starlight apart with a prism and try to analyze the absorption lines to see what a star was made of. At the time, he was in charge of the Harvard College Observatory's great 15-inch refractor. And I really get a kick out of this because their badass telescope of the day was a 15-inch diameter refractor. I should point out that CCRI's telescope today is a 16-inch telescope. So we are today have a telescope that's slightly better than the one they had in 1900, okay? Um, in any, in any, uh, that was a big telescope for the day, a 15-inch refractor. And Ed Pickering invented something called the objective prism method. Now look, I don't know if this is actually a grad student having a joke at us, but I tried to look up a, a demonstration of the objective prism method and it showed someone clamping a prism onto the top of a telescope. I don't know if it's that simple. I don't think that's how it actually works. I think you've got to gather the starlight and then you've got to send it through the eyepiece and then you put the eyepiece through a prism. I think they did use prisms in the day of course, today we do not use prisms. We use a modern device like uh, this here, this here spectrograph. A little more show and tell for students. 
Spectroscopy is very much at the heart of what astronomers do. And today we analyze starlight um, at our observatory using this device here. This is a Sheliac spectrograph. Um, and, and I actually attach this thing right here to the telescope and light comes in and it bounces off of a diffraction grating. In the old days, people like Pickering used prisms, but today we use these things called diffraction gratings. I can actually show you one. Hold on guys, I, I like show and tell. I love to show you all my toys. This uh, spectrograph that we have is a high resolution spectrograph that's capable of doing some pretty advanced science. A couple of years ago, I convinced the chairman that it was absolutely essential for education that we get ourselves one of these uh, high resolution spectrographs. And, and I wanted to show you what's, what the prisms look like. The, the, the version of a prism we use today is called a diffraction grating. I've gotta be careful with this. I don't wanna get too much dust on it. But you can see it's kind of like a shiny mirror. It actually looks exactly like the back of a, have you ever seen the back of a CD? Oh, wow, you can actually see the reflection of, uh, is that Jenny in there? Yes. Okay. Um, it actually kind of looks like the back of a CD where light kind of hits this shiny surface and it separates into its component wavelengths. Diffraction gratings have a much better ability to separate light into its component wavelengths. Wow, this stuff got kind of knocked around a little bit in its journey to my house. Okay, note to self, I'll fix that all later. Okay. Uh, hold on, students. This was kind of expensive. I want to make sure I. Yeah. yeah. All right, something like that. Okay. In any case, Pickering did not have any nice tools like this at his disposal in his day. He had to use the objective prism method. Now, <clears throat> I believe the idea that Pickering had, if you can uh, keep walking through this with me. Pickering began to collect the spectra of stars, okay? And uh, in, this, in his day, there, were, there was no color photography. So I want you guys to remember that when you actually take the spectrum of a star, do I have the spectrum of a star somewhere to show you guys? The, what, a, what a modern spectrum looks like, here's your solar spectrum here, function F531. Oh, was it 51? Yeah, here we go, 51. Um, when you take the spectrum of a star like the sun, this is what you see. You see a rainbow, and all smattered through this rainbow are these dark absorption lines. And the first thing that you need to know is every single star out there produces an absorption line spectrum. The absorption line spectrum of the sun has been well mapped out. We've identified what each and every one of these lines are related to. For instance, this C line of the solar spectrum at 656 nanometers, that's hydrogen alpha. Do you guys recognize this one, this double yellow line? Do you know what element that's related to? The, the, doub the doublet here and the yellow, I thought you might remember the atom, but maybe that's too much. That's, that's sodium, that's the sodium doublet. In any case, Ow. yeah, all right, so you didn't know mm. that, that's fine. Um, each of these lines are related to a different atom. Now, the concept that Pickering had, so here's some images of his spectra that he was taking. Remember, he was actually working in black and white photography. So his rainbows just kind of looked like a smear of white light, but he could see all the absorption lines. And I'd like to point out that at the time Pickering was doing this, in the late 1800s, we had not yet developed the Bohr model of the atom. I can't remember the exact date, but does anyone remember when Neil Bohr developed his atomic theory of the atom? I think it was like 1905 or 1910 or something. Maybe even 1915. Anyone know? When was the Bohr model of the atom produced? Oh, shoot. Uh... This is the kind of thing I should not do. Bohr model of atom. Now you might ask, why does that have to do with anything? 1913. The Bohr model of the atom was proposed in 1913. And first of all, class, how are these absorption lines produced? 
do you remember why stars have absorption lines? What's going on there? Because the absorption lines come from the different elements that are produced within the star. Where are the elements? What layer of the sun? Um, or what layer of a star? Core? No. No, photosphere. Where photosphere is correct. Come. The only light that can get to us is from the photosphere. Okay. Anyways, let me just get on with the damn story. So at the time, people knew that these lines corresponded to different atoms, but they did not yet know as much as you guys know. They didn't realize that these absorption lines were due to electrons jumping inside of an atom itself, right? So they knew that, say, 656 nanometers always came from a hydrogen atom, but they did not know that it was caused by the 3 to 2 transition of hydrogen. That hadn't been developed yet. So this was like, they were doing spectroscopy on stars before they even understood what the hell an atom was. That's my point. Now, in Pickering's day, he had a concept for how he was going to classify the elements in stars. I lied. I am going to take some notes on this. So Ed Pickering was the first person to begin the spectral classification of stars. There's Ed Pickering. He attempted to take the first spectra of stars. And when Ed Pickering began, his concept was probably something like this. He was going to take any star that had elements of hydrogen, and he was going to call it a spectral type A star. And he was going to take maybe uh, elements that had sort of uh, mod So a, a was supposed to be strong hydrogen. And then a spectral type B star was supposed to be moderate hydrogen lines. And the spectral type C was supposed to be weak hydrogen or something like this. And then he would keep going. And then D might be uh, a helium star. And maybe uh, a type E would be a star that had carbon or whatever. See, at the time, people had no idea what stars were made out of. They didn't know if stars were made out of hydrogen, helium, chocolate pudding. It could have been anything, right? So he was going to have different letters to represent different types of atomic elements. What no one knew at the time was that pretty much all stars have exactly the same composition. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, class, you're supposed to know the composition of the sun. What is it? 75% hydrogen. 70% hydrogen. 70%. I always say 75, but. 20%, 28% helium. Yep. 2%. And 2% two, other metals. And two metals. Yep, very good. Okay. So it turns out that I'm going to lie to you here. I'm going to tell you a little fib. All stars have exactly the same composition. That's not true, okay? But most stars have a composition that's very similar to this. And the metals just wiggle around. They can go from 1% to 2.5%. There are some real weirdos out there that, that have lost their hydrogen, but we won't talk about those just yet. For now, your garden variety star has almost the same composition as the sun. But Pickering didn't know this when he began. Now let me tell you a funny part of the story. So in the day, remember that Pickering wasn't just some two-bit astronomer. Ed Pickering was the director of the Harvard College Observatory. That means you're the director of Harvard's observatory program. It's about as prestigious as you should get. And Pickering was a famously grouchy person. In the day, uh, Pickering was not going to spend every night at his telescope taking photographic pictures of star spectra and analyzing them because that would take a lot of work. And this guy, you know, he's got to go home to his... Uh, luxury apartment in Back Bay and eat Cornish game hand with his wife. He's not going to be sitting out at the observatory every night. That's what you have. That's what you have flunkies to do. Okay. So in the day, their graduate students were called clerks and he had a number of gentlemen clerks who would actually stay up all night collecting the, the spectra and in the morning they would analyze it. Well, here's a picture of one of the clerks here observing through the telescope. Famously at one point, Pickering got so fed up with the incompetence of one of his clerks that he yelled, 
damn it, man, you're such a nincompoop. My maid could do a better job than you. And all the people around him began to laugh. But Pickering wasn't laughing. He was pretty upset. So eventually, he fired that clerk, and he actually hired his maid to take all of the stellar spectra at the Harvard College Observatory. And his maid was an Irish immigrant, a single mom by the name of Williamina Fleming, and her, she was responsible for cleaning his luxury apartment in Back Bay or whatever. But he had respect for her, and he knew that she was a competent woman that could get the job done. So he trained her on how to analyze and collect stellar spectra, and she became his observatory assistant. Now, this would have been very, very weird pre-1900 to have women at all doing science. That would have been seen as a very kooky thing to do. But it turned out that that was a smart move on Pickering because Williamina Fleming turned out to be one of the best assistants he'd ever had, and she became better than Pickering himself at collecting and analyzing spectroscopic data. It is said she could observe the spectrum of a star in a glance and know what type of star it was. She's also famous for having taken the first image of this picture here. She was the first person to image the, um, the Horsehead Nebula using the great Harvard uh, refractor. So um, after Pickering had started having some success analyzing stellar spectra with Williamina Fleming, he realized that he was kind of onto something here because he was probably still paying her the main wage to analyze these stellar spectra. So what does Pickering decide to do? You got it. He decides to hire a whole bevy of ladies, a whole bunch of ladies who are graduating from women's colleges. Here's a picture of my guy. That old dog. <laughs> with all of these ladies. Now, uh, Pickering at the time referred to them as his <laughs> Oh, is that doggy just bark? Yeah. It's an exciting lecture. I think it just barks through time and space. <laughs> now, these, uh, at the, in the day, Sorry. that's okay. These women were derisively known as Pickering's harem. He's up there in the observatory with all harem of ladies. And I don't know what the hell is right there. Now it's because when I was a student, you, you learned about you learned about these these uh, these these women as Pickering's harem. Nowadays that's not PC anymore. So they are now officially known as the Harvard computers after Pickering's moniker for them themselves. And historians have put a lot of brain power into analyzing what actually went on here. And I think there's kind of two different ways to look at this. If you want to take a negative lens to it, you could say it was exploitative because Pickering had a lot of data to analyze and he needed a lot of manpower to do it. And he realized that he could hire these women at a fraction of the price that he was, he was hiring the male clerks to do it. And thereby he stretched his dollar and got more analysis power. But Pickering would not have been unaware, I believe, of the social ramifications of what he was doing. Keep in mind that before 1900, that coincided with the women's suffrage movement in Europe, which eventually trickled its way over to the United States. So it would have been considered a little bit weird for him to do this, and probably he got quite a bit of ridicule from his contemporaries. And so in some sense, he might not have thought of himself as exploitative, he might have thought of himself as giving many of these women a chance to do science. And these women were actually graduating from local women's colleges like Wellesley and uh, Mount Holyoke and other places like this. And now he gets to laugh because we know his name and not theirs. <laughs> well, actually, no. Uh, can I correct you, Riker? Over time, each of these women made fundamental contributions. I wasn't talking about the women. I was talking about his, whoever was mocking him. Oh, right. Yeah. No one remembers those people. Absolutely. Right. Now, I want to be careful here. I'm not trying to be some kind of man apologist or nor do I even want to put my toe into this nightmare cesspool these days. But I'm just saying there's, there's two dimensions to this probably from my way of thinking. And in any case, it's a fascinating story. And it gets more fascinating because these women became, oh, by the way, I searched long and hard to find you guys some cool images here. And somewhere in the bowels of the internet, I discovered this picture, which I think is just so cool. So here's a picture of Williamina Fleming and the Harvard College uh, computers. The, and they're sitting here at the Harvard Observatory analyzing stellar spectra. And let's just look around this photograph for all this cool stuff that's going on. Okay, first of all, can you guys see where my mouse is? The yeah. first thing that blew my mind is they're still using these notebooks. <laughs> that design of notebook is still on the shelves today at CBS. And like, 
you know, I didn't realize it goes back that far, but that modeled black and white notebook is classic and timeless. Okay, so here's one of the ladies with a magnifying glass looking at one of the photographic negatives and analyzing the stellar spectra. Here you can see a woman in the background. That looks like a spectroscope to me. I bet that they're analyzing some stellar spectra in the laboratory, maybe heating up some hydrogen or helium and comparing it to the reference lines. Can you guys see this picture over here? This picture, um, one of the women in the uh, observatory there, her name was Henrietta Swan Levitt, and she was the first person to discover variable stars. And here you can see them measuring the change in magnitudes of Beta Auriga in December of 1889, and they're measuring the change in the apparent magnitude of Beta Auriga. Isn't that cool? So they, these are the first people to discover variable stars. This photograph is just awesome for so many different reasons. Okay, here's where the story gets really good. You'll remember that Pickering's original idea, which wasn't too well thought out, was maybe stars are gonna be made of a bunch of different spectra, and we could have A represent hydrogen lines, and B or D represent helium. And as these Harvard computers, as these women began analyzing thousands of stellar spectra, they realized that Pickering had had the wrong idea. And they suggested to him that he rearrange his sequence, and he was smart enough to listen to them. They realized that almost every star they were looking at had hydrogen in the spectrum. They were all basically made of hydrogen and helium gas. What was important is not what types of lines were there, but how strong the lines were. And for me to help you understand this, one more picture could be helpful here. Yes. Let me show you a picture. And by the way, the two women that suggested this to Pickering were Antonia Mari and Annie Jump Cannon. Wow. And so, that's an awesome name. Yeah, Annie Jump Cannon. I wish that that's a pretty good name. Wow. I want to show you guys a ranking of what they eventually came up with as the order of the spectral sequence. Um, they, the letters seem all scrambled because they were still using Pickering's original idea. But if you look here, there's a bunch of stuff going on. You can see that all the stars have absorption lines, but can you guys see this right here? Can you see this line, how it's kind of common to all the stars? Yep. That's hydrogen alpha, right? I think it's hydrogen alpha. Yeah, well, actually, that's kind of in the orange part of the spectrum, so that might not be hydrogen alpha. Definitely this one here is probably hydrogen beta. That's the line at 434 nanometers, or sorry, uh, 486 nanometers. I think if you look at the bottom one where it's uh, on M, if you look all the way on the That's the probably, end, that's that might probably be hydrogen, hydrogen alpha. Yeah. It's hard to know if these colors are accurate or not, but hydrogen alpha is definitely more red than orange. But in any case, whether or not these refer to hydrogen or helium, you can see that these lines are sort of in common for all the different stars. What does change is not the, the types of lines, but how dark the lines are. Look at a spectral type O star. The lines are ghost-like and washed out. They have hardly any presence at all. When you get to a spectral type A, the lines are very prominent. But as you get towards types G, K, and M, you can just see thousands and thousands and thousands of absorption lines appearing there. And these gals were smart enough to know what this implied about the physics of the star. So bear with me here. I want to go kind of slow with you on this. Pickering's harem, or the Harvard That's computer, your job. Harem, I want to call them. They invented what is now known as it's Phil's job, actually. My bad. Spectral classification system, or otherwise more simply known to astronomers as a star's spectral type. And the order of the spectral type went in the following sequence. O, B, A, F, G, K, F. This is definitely something I would expect you to memorize if I was going to give you a test. However, since we decided to throw tests out the window this semester, I guess you can just learn it for fun and maybe half remember it or something, okay? Now, the way students for at least 100 years have remembered the order of stars is with the mnemonic device so be a fine girl or guy, depending on your preference, or he, they, it, 
Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, all right? Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. And this is the uh, mnemonic device you use to remember the order of the spectral types. Spectral type O stars have very uh, weak hydrogen lines and they have lots of ionized, ionized metals. Um, spectral type A stars have strong hydrogen lines. I should mention that spectral type G stars, these are identical to the sun and they have lots of lines of every type, including hydrogen. And by the time you get down to a spectral type M, there are tons and tons of lines, including lines from molecular bands. Now, I never had time to explain this to you guys because time is always limited in our lectures. In fact, I should probably check the time because I have no idea. You got about 10 minutes. Okay, cool, cool. So. <clears throat> In our earlier lectures, we learned that individual atoms produce emission and absorption lines. But you guys know that atoms sometimes arrange themselves into molecules. And molecules kind of, they're kind of like two balls on a spring. They share their electrons. And if you pull them away from each other, the electrons pull them back together. If you push them too close, the electrons repel. So they're kind of like, they're kind of like vibrating molecules. Now, you can actually take a molecule of diatomic hydrogen or diatomic oxygen <laughs> and you can bless you. <laughs> bless you bless you bless you you can hit them you can hit them with a photon and you can get molecules to absorb unique photons and oscillate and vibrate that is molecules can absorb and emit emission lines just like individual atoms can when i learned that that kind of blew my mind a little where could I get those materials? To actually I need his nose. Uh, wait, what materials are you talking about? Like you said, the chemical or like the elements to make them combined and stuff. Is there like a place you could get this stuff? Or is it like if you're just a scientist with like a, a scientist card or something like that? You can just be like. Man, hey. Okay, one of the cool things about learning about chemistry is your, your resources are all around you. For a chemist, yeah. you, you can, you can, I mean, air is full of diatomic molecules and you can order stuff yeah you can order stuff from warehouses like if you want to get a brick of sodium and make a giant explosion you could do that i guess um <laughs> <laughs> yes you can get these things online i'm not even sure if you need to have a chemistry degree although it certainly helps but remember that your laboratory is all around you a clever chemist can can extract molecules just from household materials uh in a in an erlenmeyer flask in a in a beaker in a bunsen burner but it's like any wizardry you must study and learn as we are doing now if you want to learn to blow stuff up, okay? If you want to be able to create explosions and if you want to terrorize your friends with magic tricks, then you must study and learn. That's you taking your first step into that world right now. Okay, so this is the Harvard Spectral Classification System, otherwise known as the spectral type of a star. And it's going to be kind of a big deal. Let's take a look at some of the different prop. Well, okay. We got one more thing to do. And I've got one last uh, coup de gras to do with my last 10 minutes here. <laughs> Allowing me to jump. Oh, by the way, can I show you some things here? This is just, especially for people who are thinking of going on in careers in science. Uh, one, of, one, of, uh, Harvard, one of the Harvard computers that worked for Pickering was a woman known as Cecilia Payne Gaspachin. And she wrote what is considered to be the quintessential astronomy PhD thesis. This was the PhD thesis, the gold standard by which every other scientist has measured themselves. And she basically came up with the physics. She, she reveals the physics of how an absorption line is produced. In her 1925 PhD thesis, quote, stellar atmospheres, a contribution to the observational study of high temperature in the reversing layer of stars. Say what? <laughs> Her whole concept, that, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> exactly, and that's gotta be Michael. That could only be Michael there. That's okay. not me. Oh, Why is it always me? <laughs> 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 I did it one time by mistake. Okay, all right, hold on, let me get the eraser. Okay, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here.
don't make me ban you. Okay, listen. Um, her PhD thesis, basically the concept behind it was that as uh, Marcus or someone mentioned earlier, the atoms are located in the photosphere of the star. And you guys will remember that an absorption spectrum is produced when a cold, thin gas sits in front of a hot, dense solid. The inner layers of the star are a hot, dense interior that produce black body light. And as they shine through the cooler layers of the photosphere, these individual atoms are absorbing unique emission lines or absorbing unique photons, removing them from the spectrum of the star. Why is that cool? It's cool because when you look at a stellar spectrum, you're basically sampling the chemical composition of the surface of a star. That star might be located at the other end of our galaxy, and you are in a sense dipping your little toe into the pool of that star and discovering what it's made out of. If it wasn't for spectroscopy, we wouldn't know shit about the universe. It's all spectroscopy, my friends. That's what science is all about. Okay, anyways. We've now started to realize that perhaps these lines correlate to the temperatures of the star. And uh, this is kind of important here. All right, how do I get out of this mode? Here we go. Sorry, I'm still in draw mode. Okay. The, the, the computers were smart enough to realize that what was creating differences in the number of absorption lines was the surface temperatures of the stars. <coughs> Spectral type O stars have a temperature of around 30,000 Kelvin. Spectral type M type stars have temperatures around 3,000 Kelvin. And our star tends to have uh, a spectral type of around 6,000 Kelvin. And this changes their temperatures too. Like for instance, if I can go ahead in my slideshow here, if we look at a group of stars like the Pleiades, let me show you a picture of uh, Pleiades here. The Pleiades is a star cluster that's full of very bright blue stars. And for me, knowing my spectral types of stars, when I look at this grouping of stars, I think, oh, here is a cluster of really hot, really bright O and B type stars. Sometimes astronomers even refer to these types of clusters as OB associations. The spectral type O and B stars are hot, they're extremely luminous, and they're bright, and they're beautiful. On the other hand, Check out this thing called a globular cluster. You can see it's full of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of little dim red stars. These are better examples of your spectral type K and M stars. They're small, they're red, they're dim, and there's lots of them. At some point, a couple of famous scientists were so inspired by the work that these computers did that they decided to invent what is probably the most important graph in all of astronomy. It might even be considered kind of like the periodic table of the elements, but for stars. And it's a kind of a big deal. I'm ending on a high note here. It's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, named after two famous astronomers whose pictures are floating around here somewhere. Oh, nuts if they are. Well, I thought I had pictures of them. I don't know what the hell's going on. Oh, here they are. Um, it was a, a guy from the Netherlands and an American astronomer, Hertzsprung and Russell, who invented what is called, slide 58, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And their idea was, what if we took the spectral type of a star and we plotted it on the x-axis, that's kind of like the temperature of the star, and what if we took the absolute magnitude of a star and we plotted it on the y-axis, that's like the luminosity of a star. Hey students, do you think, do you think there would be any relationship between the luminosity of a star and its temperature? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What is the relationship? Inverse square. Well, well, not exactly. Wow. Stefan Boltzmann's law for stars. That's right. The luminosity should be related to both the radius and the temperature of a star. So with that in mind, let me show you the graph that they came up with. Um, before I show you the book's cartoon version, this is a real AST HR diagram produced by the Hipparcos satellite, which I talked about in our last lecture. Notice that the stars are not scattered randomly around the graph, but you'll notice that the stars have a kind of pattern to them which is complex. First of all, most stars kind of fall along this wiggly diagonal line which is known to astronomers as the main sequence. 
And if we were to plot maybe a thousand stars like they did on this graph here, maybe about 80% of them all fall along this main sequence line. But not all of them fall along the main sequence line. There's a branch here called the red giant branch where some stars kind of deviate from it. The book has tried to helpfully explain this to us in, in a cartoon form with this cartoonized version of the HR diagram. And I gotta say guys, I know we looked at this last week in our, our uh, homeworks. This is a very powerful information graphic. It kind of tells you the whole life history of stars in an easy to read graph. And this graph secretly contains all the fundamental parameters of a star that a person might be interested in. The mass, the luminosity, the temperature, and the radius. Now, before you start saying, geez, Brendan, I'm getting kind of tired of this shit. I don't really need to know what the plasma ionization fractions halfway through the radius of a star is. That sounds like something really unhelpful for me getting a job and living my life as a productive human being. Okay, wrong. You do need to know this. Okay, you'll die without it. Uh, but in particular, if you're willing to understand some of this stuff, if you're willing to talk to me about the luminosities of stars, you will discover some cool, weird, freaky shit about our universe that will blow your mind. So you're gonna have to put up with me talking about stars here because we're gonna culminate on some very interesting things. Before we end our class, let's reproduce this diagram in our notes because it's just that. Okay, introducing what astronomers refer to as the HR diagram. This will be our last note for the day, but I wanted to make sure I got to it, all right? Follow along with me. Using a straight edge, we're going to make a graph with luminosity on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. Okay. So here I'm plotting luminosity or absolute magnitude. And on the x-axis, I'm going to plot the spectral type of a star. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. And this means that we're measuring temperature in Kelvin, but we are measuring temperature to the left, where the temperature is increasing to the left-hand side. As we discovered, most stars on the HR diagram fall along this diagonal line. And this diagonal line is called the main sequence. Now you don't know this yet, but it's gonna turn out that the significance of stars being on the main sequence is this is where stars fuse hydrogen into helium during their lives. So this is what's known as the main sequence. Our own sun is a main sequence star. The next most important part is a branch of stars that kind of grows up into the right. And this is known as the asymptotic red giant branch, or more simply, we'll just refer to them as the red giants. <laughs> There's also another zone of stars located up at the top. And these stars I'm putting in blue. There's usually not too many of them. These are the blue supergiants. And lastly, we have a little graveyard of dead stars I think purple is a good color for dead things. So we'll put these in purple. And this is a zone for dead stars known as the white dwarfs. And these are the four major zones of your HR diagram. Now, because class is coming to an end, I cannot explain every single aspect of this graph to you in one moment. But we are going to continue to use this graph to understand how stars are born, how they live, how they evolve, and eventually how they die and explode. This graph 
tells you the entire history of a star's life. And if you plot a star in this graph, you know more about it than you would ever, well, a lot, you know a lot about the star, let's just say that. Um, please keep in mind, students, that in this graph, luminosity increases up, temperature to the left, the radius of a star, uh, I don't wanna make this too messy, but the radius of a star increases diagonally up and to the left, and the mass of a star along the main sequence increases up to the right. Please notice that all four of our key stellar parameters are indicated on this graph. The temperature is on the x-axis. The luminosity is on the y-axis. The radius is along the right diagonal, and the mass is along the left diagonal. Okay, I think that uses up my time with you today. Yes, more or less. We'll say that uses up my time. There's more I could say, but I won't say it. <clears throat> okay, let's just take a moment to let you guys finish getting that down. And let's talk about what comes next. We're gonna do some homework, yeah? Yep. Yeah. We're gonna yep. crush the homework. Now, I feel bad because our, our lectures are getting a little bit uh, behind the homeworks, but I think it's just important that we do something together every day. Is our next homework all chapter 16 or is it a mix of 16 and 17? Hold on, I'm gonna open it up. All chapter 16. That's good. That gives me some time to catch up because next week I'm gonna mush 16 and 17 together. I also have some bad news. Six, the chapter 16 homework is kind of hard, but I'm gonna- oh. <laughs> well, I think it's hard. There's at least one or two tough problems. <laughs> Um, I'm going to try to be quick as I can. I'll, I'll figure out ways to shortcut it if I can. Okay. Uh, why don't we all take a moment? Do we like our little five minute pause where I drink some iced tea? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's good for me. Yes. Is that good for you guys? Yeah. yeah, it works for me. All right. So, uh, let's stay lo logged in. I've been recording this. I'm going to now stop the recording and that way I have a break between, uh, lecture and homework. Okay, so wait, did I?